water. It's all around us. And it's pretty amazing. Everyone knows its molecular formula, H2O. But what happens if we try to split the H2 from the O? Let's dive deeper into it. Before we explain how we can split a water molecule, maybe we should answer why we would want to do that in the first place. A very important product of water splitting is hydrogen, an attractive energy carrier that can deliver or store a tremendous amount of energy. Hydrogen's most common uses today include fertilizer production, rocket fueling, and petroleum refining. A lot of hydrogen is produced each year, around 50 billion kilograms. But currently, it is mainly done by steam reforming, which can be really bad to the environment. Therefore, it is critical to explore more efficient and eco-friendly production methods of hydrogen gas. So how exactly can we get the much desired hydrogen from water? Spilling water molecules physically might be troublesome. And this is why we will use electricity. Using a cathode, electrolyte and anode, we can split the H2 molecules into hydrogen and hydroxide ions. The hydrogen ions will be attracted towards the cathode and will bond with the surface of the catalyst, forming H2 molecules. Active catalysts are required to minimize the overpotential necessity to drive the hydrogen evolution reaction. Now let's analyze the reaction even more. The hydrogen evolution reaction, also known as HER, can occur through either the volmer herovsky step or the volmer tafel mechanism. In the reaction formulas, the asterisk indicates an empty active site on the catalyst surface and the H with an asterisk indicates a hydrogen atom bound to the active site. In both mechanisms, the rate of the overall reaction is highly influenced by the hydrogen absorption energy. When the hydrogen binds to the surface too weakly, the absorption or the volmer step will limit the overall reaction rate. On the other side, if the binding is too strong, the desorption step, which can be either the Herovsky or the Tafel step, will limit the rate. So the sweet spot for the best catalytic activity would be reached when the binding is neither too weak nor too strong. In other words, when the hydrogen absorption free energy is equal to zero. This is also known as the Sabatier principle, named after the French chemist Paul Sabatier. Now let's talk about volcanoes. This is me at the Fjordalsfjall eruption in Iceland, where I travel to study the ins and outs of volcano plots next to a real active volcano. Not only are volcanoes cool, but they're a great representation of the Sabatier principle. Volcano plots are a way to visualize the effectiveness of different catalysts by plotting adsorption energy versus the rates of the catalysts, and they are named so because they take the form of volcanoes. On the left side of the volcano's peak, the activity is decreasing with a decreasing integral adsorption energy, or delta EH, because there are fewer and fewer available sites for the hydrogen recombination at the surface, and the hydrogen bonds too strongly. On the right side, the opposite happens. Hydrogen becomes more unstable with increasing delta EH, and the activity decreases here. Here, hydrogen bonds too weakly. The metals or metal alloys that are placed near the top of the volcano are the best catalysts. This is platinum, our favorite metal. If you look at the volcano plot, it is situated nearly perfectly at the top, making it the optimal choice since all the reaction steps of the hydrogen evolution process on this metal are thermoneutral. You would then think that platinum was the best possible catalyst for hydrogen peroxide, right? Wrong. Platinum is a scarce metal that is difficult to mine from the Earth's crust. This tiny piece alone costs $100, and the current monetary value of platinum per kilogram is about $37,000 US dollars, making it a very expensive and impractical option. Yeah, we need to start looking for cheaper and more abundant material. One such catalyst could be the molybdenum disulfide with a hydrogen absorption rate energy of 1 per 92 electron volts, which is not close to our desired value of 0 electron volts. It was believed that the catalyst molybdenum disulfide was inactive for HER. However, it was later revealed that the age of molybdenum disulfide at 50% hydrogen coverage, it possesses a hydrogen absorption free energy of 0.08 electron volts and near 
true optimum value for electron volts. According to the article Combining Theory and Experiment in Electrocatalysis Inside Inner Materials Design, molybdenum disulfide was synthesized with a carbon black support exposing the edge sites. The researchers then examined the membrane electrode assembly setup. They found that the HER activity was found to scale linearly with the molybdenum disulfide perimeter length and not the molybdenum disulfide surface area. The edge sites of a material are very catalytically active, while its basal planes, that are thermodynamically favored, are not. To increase the activity of molybdenum disulfide, it is therefore useful to maximize the fraction of exposed edge sites on the surface to bulk sites by changing the structure, by nanostructuring the material into a double gyro structure, which minimizes basal planes, we expose a high fraction of edge sites, which, in turn, increases activity. This is done by making porous molybdenum disulfide thin films with great surface curvature. Another way to improve the activity of molybdenum disulfide is by dispersing nanoparticles on supports with high surface area. This could be achieved by situating the molybdenum disulfide nanoparticles on reduced graphene oxide nanosheets. An experiment showed that the support of those sheets led to reduced aggregation and increased dispersion of the nanoparticles compared to molybdenum disulfide synthesis without the sheets. Because of this, the activity improved as there were more exposed edge sites and enhanced charge transport. Another method is by changing the structural properties of molybdenum disulfide by inserting lithium ions and thereby affecting its activity. This is called intercalation of lithium ions and they lead to the chemical exfoliation of molybdenum disulfide. This leads to two kinds of changes in the chemical structure. Molybdenum disulfide is built similar to a sandwich with layers of molybdenum disulfide stacked on top of each other, held together by van der Waals forces. A higher fraction of edge sites increases the catalytic activity, and lithium ion intercalation achieves this by chemically exfoliating the molybdenum disulfide sandwich, separating the layers with the ions and exposing more edge sites. The other way lithium ion intercalation can change the activity is by changing the chemical structure of molybdenum disulfide, resulting in an almost completely different compound but with the same stoichiometry. This new structure is more stable with lithium ions and positively affects the activity of the catalyst. So that's it. Did we find the perfect way of producing hydrogen from all this water? Not quite. Engineers are still in search for the perfect non-precious metal analog to platinum for the HER in both acid and in base. In addition to the catalyst activity, long-term stability is an equally important metric and should be reported in conjunction with activity. We're just beginning this journey towards a cleaner and more sustainable world. The future looks bright when we come together as aspiring engineers and work towards a better world for everyone. It's me, Margaret, okay, talking about volcano plops in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> this is too good. <laughs> so you're naked under my price? That was very forced.